empty space by volume. So it, it really is, a, 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 it, we, we now have to answer the question why it is that we don't fall through the floor. And uh, the answer is quantum physics. It, so there isn't a, 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 an answer based upon, you can't just say the electrons repel each other through the uh, electromagnetic you know, life charges repel that law. It's not, it's not just that, it, 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 we, we need this thing called the Pauli exclusion principle to, to, to explain why we don't fall through the floor, something as simple as that. Uh, do you think the whole area of the quantum physics suffers from some of these lousy analogies, like the Schrodinger's cat being, could be dead or might not be dead in the box, and um, the Heisenberg principle, I know you talk about that in the book, and how people misuse these ideas. Mm. Yeah, well the uncertainty principle is one of the <clears throat> most interesting and least well understood principles in physics. The, the first thing to say is you derive it from these rules. So in the book we do that. You start off with the rules of how particles move around and you can derive the uncertainty principle. So it's not some kind of strange postulate. And as I think my friend Dara Green says, it also doesn't mean I had a bit of a bad day last Tuesday. There's something wrong with my head. It's eyes and blood. It's all uncertain. It's, not, it's a very precise statement which you derive from the rules. Um, so I think one of the things, I mean, Schrodinger's cat and those, the, when, when the theory emerged, really in the 1920s, but started at the turn of 1900 with experiments around there, it, it was very poorly understood. There was a lot of debate about it because it's a, it's a big shift in your understanding of reality. I mean, even, even the statements that nature behaves in a probabilistic sense, so, and we all know that they knew that, there's half life. So, there's probabilistic a, sense, so, what do you mean? Well, well that? look at the half life, look at the decay of a, of a radioactive <coughs> atom. Well, everybody, oh, already I can this, everybody knew that that was a statistical law, there's an exponential decay, right. it tells you, it's a random element to it. So that was a shock in a Newtonian world, so it's, it's a very difficult thing to understand, because you, until that time, all physicists thought physics was deterministic, and if you know, this happens, then this happens, and we can work it all out, that turns out not to be the case. So I think a lot of these analogies and confusions came around in the 20s, and that's actually the way it's taught a lot. So we do start at university with the Schrodinger equation, and you almost build in all the, the misunderstandings of the last century into the theory. So I, I don't think, what we try to do in our book is, as I said, we use the approach which is really down to Richard Feynman. So it's a nine, beginning in the 1940s, 50s, it's the, the foundation of quantum field theory, developed in the 70s, I suppose you could say. So, so th I think now those, those things serve to obscure the theory. They look weird. The cat can be alive or dead. You, you, you have to see it in the double slit experiment. You see, the electron knows. If you close a slit off, then it knows. Well, of course it knows, because it's like closing a slit off when a wave goes through. If you close a slit off, it's not some magical thing that said, oh, I'll change the interference pattern on this screen. It's just that you change the... The, the properties of the experiment. You do a different experiment, you get a different answer. So I think it's quite simple. The, it's interesting though, I just, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to quote you on that. I think it's well, quite well, simple. I should say that. <laughs> 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 well, 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 how much time have we got? Oh, we're fine. Let's have a jacket coming here. There's an interesting thing though in the book which, which shows how difficult it can be to put into language precisely. And uh, things. It's, it's quite interesting from a, a, a book writing and popularization sense. It's this statement that if you, if you put a particle there, then it can be anywhere in the universe at the next instant. This is correct. And it's also correct that if you change something, then things hop around and you do other calculations and the thing changes instantly. Right? So you have a problem there. Anyone knows any relativity? He says, well, what do you mean instant? Does that mean you can cause and effect a lot of volts and bits? Which they would if you transfer information. But actually, so in the book we made a statement which is essentially that, which is essentially true. But actually it, it triggered later, because we interacted with a few physicists, particularly a very good physicist, Sean Carroll actually, just, uh, saying is it really true in quantum field theory? Is that when you put relativity in, is it really true? Does it really spread across the entire universe? And the answer is we're not actually entirely sure. Um, and so, and Jeff is actually working with a PhD student at the moment on some really foundational issues in quantum field theory about exactly how that works. In field theory. I don't know if you want to say anything about that, it's quite technical, but it's, it's very int What's interesting though is you write a book, you explain something, it's correct, um, yeah, but then is it entirely correct? Are there some subtleties? And so it's a very subtle theory. I mean, that brings so, me on something yeah. else I want to ask about with this. I just, I just yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. Have you got well, uh, the comment is, yeah, it's work ongoing. Yeah. <laughs> there, there are particles that, uh, the correlations that can exist at very large distances are in quantum mechanics. 
they exist. So particles over here are correlated to another particle that can be very far away, and their correlations are instantaneous. But it is also true that the theory does not allow uh, signaling at, at speeds faster than the speed of light. So in that sense, it is. It is. But seeing how that works, when you're talking about rules where particles can hop and fling themselves around all over the universe in an instant, seeing how causality, that this law of cause and effect, and, and, and the finiteness of the speed of light, how that emerges out of, of all of that, is not is not so uh, is not so clear. Now we'll take some uh, audience questions in a sec. So do think of some uh, questions. We'll, we'll have time for a few. Um, but I just do you talk about the language here and trying to explain it and talking about this point in space and, and coming up with analogies. Uh, could you not? I presume you'd actually quite like to just do it as a maths book. Do you have some equations in there? Is it a lot easier to explain these things with num with maths and with, with numbers? I think, it, I mean, we, we wanted to calculate, at the end of the book we calculate what's called the Chandra Safe Limit, uh, and we, we, we don't calculate it absolutely precisely, we just a lot of intervals and things, but we get, we get quite close to the answer to a very fundamental question, which is essentially, what's the, what's the biggest blob of matter that can hold itself up with nothing, with nothing else, just so, so there's no nuclear fusion reactions, it's the question of what's the biggest mass of a dead star, essentially, that can just sit there and hold itself up through the exclusion principle, actually. The fact that you can't put all these point-like particles on top of each other. And, and you can calculate that, and Chandra Sekhar did it, and you get a number which is 1.4 times the mass of the sun. It's a quite remarkable calculation, because you can do it from first principles. You don't need to know about stars, you don't need to know, you don't need to know that such a thing exists. Uh, there's a very, I think Chandra Sekhar himself said, but I think we, we have it in the book. And you could imagine doing this calculation in this room. You could have never gone out and looked at the sky. And then you go out, get a telescope, and look for these white dwarf stars, as they're called, so stars with the fusion reactions have stopped. And you will find there are none bigger than 1.4 times the mass of the sun. So it's a quantum mechanical calculation. So to do that, and to get numerically close without using calculus, I think is a beautiful demonstration that the theory works. So we do that. But you've obviously got some equations in, because you want some numbers to come out. To retreat into numbers and equations. And that's that would be your, would so be, that would be the... Would you, be bad, right? Well, it would be bad for a popular science book, but that's yeah. presumably your natural Habitat, it, isn't it? No, 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 that would be, no, you, you, if, you, if, if you only really are understanding it through the equations, then I don't think that you're understanding what you're talking about. You, you, you should be able to explain it without equations. What the maths does is it, well, at, at the professional level, is it, you know, it really just gives you the, it's the conduit, it's the mechanism by which you go and compare to the numbers that come out of experiments. You know, you, it's numbers so this involved. is a number, it's so you need a bit of maths, stars. right? And uh, 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 it also gives you tremendous, so that process gives you huge amounts of confidence. So there's a famous calculation in, in quantum electrodynamics, the theory of uh, electrons and photons, which is responsible for pretty much every phenomenon that we can see in this room, with the exception of gravity. Everything light, it gets better light, is, and how light works, and how magnetism works, and so on. Now this calculation is it's a simple, it's a simple calculation. Well, the calculation is not, but it's simple to describe. It's, how, how, does, use of simple. how does, how does an electron behave in the vicinity of a magnet? And uh, that calculation can be done using quantum theory. And uh, uh, it, it's been calculated, the calculation is to about 10 significant figures. I think it's more, uh, it's at least 10 significant. So there's a theoretical number that somebody calculated using quantum physics, explaining how an electron behaves near, near to a magnet. That number, uh, 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 by the way, to do that calculation and get that kind of precision, requires entertaining the idea that the electron is interacting with the magnet in loads of different ways, really sophisticated well, every, and complicated. Every possible way, every possible way it can interact important. with the magnet. It is interacting with the magnet that way. You add them all up, <coughs> you get this, this number, which is 10 digits long, independently and by people who do not know how to do the calculations. Because the calculation... Right? <laughs> <laughs> people built an experiment to measure that property of the electron to the same precision. In fact, they measured it more accurately than the theorists have calculated it. And, the, and that gives a 10-digit number. Those two numbers agree with each other in every digit. That is the most precise test of any theory ever. And it's, so, so, so it's just well, unbelievable. That's, what, that, that's why you do the maths at the end, you know, to get that kind of uh, confirmation. But if you emphasize that only if you take into account every possible thing or uh, all the ones that count up to some accuracy. Every possible thing the electron can do. That's the way that you do it. And that's why it's one of the most sensible ways of looking for new physics, one of the sensitive ways. Because if, if, that, if that 
dis changes a bit so the theoretical number doesn't agree with the experiment, it's because the electron is doing something that isn't in the theory, which is why people measure it. Okay, so let's have some my brain start to hurt a bit now.